So good evening. So welcome to From the Front Lines, New Directions in Cancer Research. I'm Ken Minotti. I'm the Senior Vice President for Development here at MSK, and I want to thank you very much for taking the time to join us this evening. I'd also like to thank you for your various generous financial contributions and your commitment to MSK. Your annual gifts every year are making a big difference here at MSK. They empower our scientists and our researchers to do the work, the important work, to outsmart cancer. And as many of you know, there's a lot more work to be done. There are more than 400 subtypes of cancer, and MSK is one of the few comprehensive cancer centers where the needed research is needed to both treat and to research all. In addition, you may know that 90% of the cancer deaths are not caused by the original cancer. They're the result of metastasis, cancer spread. So tonight, we have a very special guest, Dr. Juan Massaguet. Dr. Massaguet has been a member of our MSK community for over 30 years, and he's the director of the Sloan Kettering Institute. And also, Dr. Massaguet is the world leader in the study of and understanding of metastasis. And most recently, he's identified a molecule necessary for cancer cells to grow in a new location. So tonight we have an opportunity to hear more from Dr. Massaguet and the exciting work that he's doing and where it may lead us. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Massaguet to the table. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Uh, how are you? Well, it's a great opportunity to share these uh, uh, 30 minutes of presentation with you to uh, take the opportunity to thank you for the support that you've provided. Um, and to tell you that, of course, it's in the mission of Memorial Sloan Kettering to uh, uh, address the problem of cancer, to come up with better ways uh, to diagnose it and to treat it. The new therapies, the new approaches to diagnosis that you keep hearing about and you may be beneficiaries of uh, result from exciting developments, uh, recent developments perhaps in the clinic, uh, in what is called you know, clinical research, clinical trials. But what is being tried in these trials uh, are drugs or approaches that come from preclinical development, from ideas and knowledge about what might we be doing better in order to uh, address the problem of cancer. That comes from, of course, understanding the problem, identifying first the specific problem, understanding it, and then figuring out ways of doing that. That basic understanding is what we call basic research, or comes from what we call basic research. Um, I am the director of the Sloan Kettering Institute, which is the arm of a Sloan Kettering dedicated to uh, experimental basic research into cancer. And today, uh, we are going to use the time to share with you insights obtained through the approaches of basic research uh, into uh, that, that insights that come uh, from uh, asking questions about what is metastasis? What is and why and how cancers are spread? Because as uh, Ken Manotti just mentioned, 90% of deaths from cancer are not from the primary tumor, but from the tumor that is spread and that became in the process more aggressive and more resistant, reluctant to respond to therapy. So tumors are spread. Why do tumors are spread? How do they do that? Well, the tumor emergence and its spread uh, are processes or events that happen uh, in organisms, in us, as we develop. Uh, this is life. This is from the moment the uh, cell that initiates each and every one of us, the fertilized egg, uh, begins to uh, divide, begins to form an embryo. These few initial cells are all identical. They have the same genome and they are doing all the same thing, which is to just grow. And they are not specialized into doing anything. But progressively, they begin to differentiate into the various cell types, tissue types, uh, organs, and features of the organism. And then we spend the rest of our lives just keeping that going, uh, regenerating the tissues because they need daily uh, exchange of cells to keep them so, themselves fresh or to regenerate themselves when there is uh, damage of any kind. 
Uh, this is all uh, very well. It's very well controlled and it's very kept under, it's kept under tight vigilance by the immune system. The immune system is detecting not only foreign invaders, uh, microorganisms that need to be eliminated, but also detecting uh, cells that are not doing their job correctly. And they may not be doing their job correctly because they are mutant cells, cells they have uh, acquired through accident of one kind or another, internal errors of our tissues as they divide, or external uh, mutagens from tobacco, from radiation, from other sources. They have accumulated cancer mutations, they have begun to uh, misbehave, uh, but they are showing signs of being stressed. And a cell that is stressed is detected by the immune system and eliminated. Except that vigilance sometimes fails, and this is when a tumor emerges. This is cancer, or a representation of cancer, the disease as it progresses. From the tumor that emerged, because cells that were misbehaving were not stopped uh, on time, and they managed to develop a tumor somewhere in the uh, lung, in the breast, in the prostate, in the intestine, anywhere. Uh, this tumor will uh, grow undetected until it is diagnosed. During that time, this tumor, microscopic as it is, and then becomes a little larger, but still not detected, uh, progressively invades the surrounding tissue. Uh, the spreading front of the tumor is called the invasion front. And is it invading, it is also engulfing vessels, uh, blood vessels. And of course, these blood vessels are surrounded by these invasive cells, so it's no surprise that some of these cells move, pass into the bloodstream, and from the moment they escape. And that is in a tumor that is there doing this every hour of every day of every week before it was eventually diagnosed. So, uh, uh, if we have a tumor, when we have a tumor, some cells will have escaped. How many? Millions. What happens to them? The vast majority die. The tumor is diagnosed and then is treated, is removed surgically in many cases. However, at that time, a minority of these cells have managed already to infiltrate various organs. Now, this is terrifying to people when they first hear it. But calm down, this is not disease yet, this is not metastasis, these are just pathogenic cells. The analogy is also pathogenic bacteria, pathogenic germs. We are exposed to pathogens, we, we have them on us all the time. There is some flu around, there is some cold around, we have cold or flu virus on us, but we don't have disease, we don't have infection because these pathogens have to break through what? Our immune system. The same is true for pathogenic cells that emerge in this case, not from the bacterial population, but from the malignant population. They are here, and they may, no, may do nothing at all, ever. Uh, but some of them may go, may go on to progress, and then there is metastasis, and then we have the, uh, the, the recurrence. How do these cells leave, and how do they get from this stage when you are disease-free, you just have pathogens, which is normal, to this stage when your disease has, has returned. Well, um, we spend a lot of time in my laboratory studying, and we, we are still spending a lot of time studying how these uh, aggressive lesions are dominating their organs, their host organs. But eventually it became even more important to understand what gives rise to, this, uh, to these lesions, which is this subpopulation. What are these cells? How come they survive uh, where 99.99% of the cells that left that tumor uh, fail to survive? Uh, how are they managing to stay in tissue, isolated, alone, not growing, not yet? They may take months, years, even decades, or never do it. But they are there surviving, growth arrested, they are resistant to drugs because, of course, to this person we are giving chemotherapy, adjuvant chemotherapy, just to try and clean up our tissues of any contaminating pathogenic cells. Uh, however, this therapy uh, was developed against what? Growing tumors. Yet we are using it against what? Non-growing solitary cells. So it's no surprise that chemotherapy, as we have it now, adjuvant chemotherapy, 
is not fully effective. It's not optimized for something that we don't even know. We just know it is there. So we want to know what makes these cells uh, resistant to therapy. Also resistant to immunity, they are now being seen by the immune system. They are surrounded by it, yet they are escaping, evading it. And they have tumor regenerating capacity. Unfortunately, some of these may, in some people, progress, uh, start growing one day in a dominant way to generate metastasis. So in the lab, we develop models to study this by taking cells from uh, primary tumors, placing them into the bloodstream of mice, allowing them to uh, infiltrate and seed the organs that you know, at their will, the lung, the kidney, the brain, and others, and then study them and study what they do. We went on to find that these cells indeed in these models, like in people, are found, most of them, solitary, not growing. But here and there we saw a cluster of cells, 10, 15, 20 cells, together as a cluster. And when we use markers that detect cells that are proliferating or have proliferated, these cells indeed were growing. However, if we went into these mice one month later or two months later, we did not see that these cells had grown more. Again, we found the same. Single cells, many, mostly single cells, quiet, not growing, and a few clusters of this size, not larger, like the ones that were already there two months ago. So that means that these cells, once in a while, proliferate, but when they do that, they don't prosper. Something prevents them from getting these clusters to grow larger into a real metastasis. That is part uh, an experiment that really turned our way of thinking, uh, on its head, our way of thinking about this latent or dormant metastasis state. It taught us that this experiment, that it is dor not dormant, the, the, this stage of metastasis, not dormant at all, in fact, of no metastasis, it's not yet metastasis, it's not dormant at all. What is the experiment? Well, we take these mice where we inoculate the uh, lung or breast cancer cells in these models from human. Uh, we allow these cells to seat, as you saw, the organs. And half of the mice, we do nothing. One mouse, among many, does develop a metastasis that will be lethal, as in people, but the others are fine. The experiment was to take the other half of the mice and uh, deplete from these mice uh, a certain class or type of immune cell. It's called a natural killer cell. The cell that is in charge of detecting stressed cells, cancer cells, and killing them. And when we did that, there was, as you can see, an immediate explosion of metastasis, multiple lesions in many organs. So that said the following. It said that when cancer cells arrive from the bloodstream into a, an organ, they come out of the, of the, of the, of the, of the bloodstream. Um, they try to populate the organ. Most of them die. But some of them that have the capacity to enter into a non-growth state can remain there, but they will stop proliferating, try to regenerate the tumor, and when they do that, these natural killer cells will eliminate them. If they have, so to speak, the good sense of not proliferating, then they will not be spotted. So this state, which is actually, we want to discover, self-impose. They proactively tell themselves, you know what, let's not grow. When they do that, they are not growing, but they are surviving. Because we've gone on to learn that these NK cells do not spot a resting uh, cell. A resting cell is not a stress. They become a stress and they show signs of it when these cancer cells attempt to proliferate. Of course, over time, they may be a lucky one. Or over time, they may be a lull, a decrease in immune surveillance. And then we can have the outbreak. So that was the first great finding that, that taught us how to, how to think about the problem. What else kills these cells? It's just immunity. Actually, we have many defenses against cells that don't belong. Uh, the example here is extracted from another series of studies, uh, in this case of metastasis to one of those specific organs, the brain. Brain metastasis is a big problem. So we spotted and tracked these cells as they have arrived through the circulation 
into, uh, through the bloodstream into the brain of uh, a mouse in this case. These cells do remarkable things. They come out, they spread on the vessels in purple, the vessels that they, they just came out of, and more on that spreading in a moment. But once they do that, we discover that they are detected by the most important, the most abundant cell in the brain. The most in, uh, abundant cell in the brain is not the neuron, it's called the astrocyte, because they look like a stars. They are multi-pronged cells. These astrocytes are in charge of keeping order in the brain and protecting the neurons. If there is a cell that doesn't belong in the brain, it doesn't have to be a cancer cell, it could be a lymphocyte from the circulation, the astrocyte will get very angry, will detect it, will respond to it by killing it. Uh, we went on to find that to a cancer cell, these astrocytes give a very poor reception. A chain reaction will generate a factor, FAS ligand, FAS L, that is a killer and will kill these cells. Now, the cells that do manage to survive is because they have the capacity to produce an antidote, serpin, which prevents this cycle of kill the cancer cell to be stopped. As these cells grow, however, they are happy to keep the astrocytes around. That was surprising. It was almost embarrassing. We have just published how bad the astrocytes are for the cancer cells and they have to protect themselves. Yet we went on to find, and pathologists told us, listen, uh, in real brain metastasis, there's lots of astrocytes. How come if they are bad for the cancer cell, the, the cancer cell that succeeded to form a metastasis keeps the astrocytes around? Well, we've learned as cancer biologists that if a tumor has a lot of something, even if that something is meant to prevent the tumor from growing, but if the tumor grew, if it won, it's probably enslaving that immune component. So this is exactly what we went on to find here now with the astrocytes. Uh, the cancer cells, in addition to this ability, if they are going to succeed, is because they form cell-to-cell -cell intimate junctions with the astrocytes that support their growth and they're resistant to therapy. We're going to find that these so-called gap junctions are formed by proteins that are produced on the membrane uh, of the cancer cells to hook up with the proteins of the gap junctions that astrocytes normally produce to form junctions with other cells in the brain. These junctions allow the passage of molecules from one cell to the other. We went on to find what is the molecule that the cancer cell wants to pass to the astrocyte and why. It's called CGAMP, and this molecule when passes through these junctions that the cancer cell form with the astrocyte to the astrocyte, it makes the astrocyte, forces the astrocyte to produce factors that uh, support the growth and survival of the cancer cell. Just an example of how uh, contrived, how far a, a cancer cells go, have to go in order to overtake a host organ. That in part explains why it's so difficult for a cancer cell to ever succeed as metastasis. The problem is in the numbers. With millions trying, they can always be a lucky one, and then we have trouble. I told you before that from basic understanding like this come ideas for therapy. The idea came because uh, one of uh, the two principal investigators in this study uh, is a physician scientist, so she's a brilliant experimentalist in the lab, but she's also a physician, a, uh, a neuro-oncology uh, expert, uh, Adrienne Boire. She said, Joanne, there are drugs, FDA approved, that are described to have activity against these gap junctions. One of them is meclofenamate, approved for many years, used against pain, not very frequently used, but it's there, safe. Um, why don't we try it? We have these mouse models with this brain metastasis, and sure enough, administering, administering uh, meclofenamate um, uh, prevented, suppressed very much the growth of the metastasis in the brain of the mice. That was so um, remarkable that um, Adrian encouraged herself to write a clinical trial. She got it approved, and she has now completed the first leg, the phase one clinical trial, without undue toxicity, 
as expected. This was already an approved drug, and it appears with benefit for patients with brain metastasis that is reluctant to respond to any therapy uh, and is progressing. Several of these patients are showing remarkable responses. It's being analyzed for progression to phase two, um, uh, analyzed by biostatisticians, but one doesn't need a biostatistician uh, to realize that this, this idea has made it to it. Time will tell how successful this is going to be, but this is an example of how you go very quickly from basic understanding to, uh, to clinical application. How quickly? Before the paper describing all these was accepted by the journal, Adrian had already gotten the trial approved and recruited the first three patients. That's how fast this can happen at Sloan Kettering. What else? What else do these cells need to grow? I've been telling you what kills them and what they need to do in order to prevent that from eliminating them. Well, this is a picture of one of these cancer cells arriving through the bloodstream uh, into the brain of a mouse, uh, obtained with uh, high-end uh, confocal microscopy. This cell is emerging, has the head already uh, through the wall of the capillary, and moments later will have emerged. And it does this remarkable thing of staying put now on top of the walls of the capilla capillary from which it emerged. It actually hugs the capillary. You see these little arms, like a panda bear hugging up a tree? That's what they do. As the sort of thing that if you see once, you'd never forget. You would have thought that this cell would crawl and start forming a, 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 a little tumor here, perhaps. That's not what they do. This is what they do. And they do it so fervently, this, this sticking and spreading, that as they migrate on this capillary, as you can see in this movie, they don't hesitate pushing out of the way the cells that normally surround the capillary. They are called pericytes. They control the, uh, the uh, uh, blood flow through the capillary. They are there for a purpose. Uh, and they are adhering themselves, even though the movie doesn't show this very clearly. The migrating cancer cell that has emerged will push one out. Now it binds again. Now it's pushing the other two out. So this is not just at the moment when they have emerged and they are there solitary. As they grow, these cells, they have divided now three times. So one cell made two, then four, then eight, eight cells. And they are growing, spreading on these capillaries, on these blood capillaries. They will form a sheath around all of them before they begin to grow into a thicker sphere-like tumor. We have identified the molecule that allows these cells to do that, to adhere, the Velcro molecule. Uh, it's called L1-CAM, L1 cell adhesion molecule. This is the molecule that's especially um, employed for these cells to adhere to the protein layer that covers, coats the capillaries. It's called the vascular base basement membrane. And this protein, which is mediating this adhesion, this is not just a feature, a posture of the cells. This is one that they absolutely require in order to, um, to proliferate. If we genetically take out, take away this L1, uh, L1 GAM protein from the metastatic cells, the cells will still arrive in the brain uh, from the, you know, through the circulation. They will come out of the vessels. They will sit on the vessels. But without L1 GAM, they cannot spread. It's normal, spreading, hogging. This is just sticking, sitting, not a spreading. Without a spread, there is no growth. Without growth, there is no very little metastasis. So that immediately tells us this is a great target for therapy. It's made greater by the fact that even though we discovered this studying breast cancer cells in the brain and lung cancer cells in the brain, now we know that this molecule is used by many different tumor types for metastasis, not just to the brain, also to the lungs, to the liver, <clears throat> and to the bone marrow. Now we are getting to the to begin to answer the questions that uh, that uh, pertain to what makes a cancer cell metastatic. 
Forget about in what organ and by, by tumor type. What is the essence of the metastasis competent, metastasis initiating cell? We'll learn here that one of the things that they need is the, the cell adhesion molecule to stick to what they, find, found, what they find around vessels and that sticking in ways that we have now been able to define tells them it's okay to grow, you are now well anchored. Even though you are a cancer cell, you need some anchorage in order to have growth. You need, you, you need and have nutrients and oxygen coming from the bloodstream, but if you don't spread, you don't have the right anchorage and that will prevent you from growing. So we are now raising antibodies to be tried as drugs that will um, uh, 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 prevent these cells from doing that, from doing this, and facilitate their killing by the immune system, and that is ongoing. What else, what other questions could I share with you? Well, another one that may be in your mind is, where do these cells come from? Where, where, where do they learn this L1 cam Velcro sticking trick that allows them to commence uh, the reinitiation of a tumor at a distance, what we call metastasis? I didn't mention early, but these cells have the properties of certain properties of stem cells, adult stem cells. The kind of cell that is not a specialized, that is present in all of our tissues, present in embryos when they develop, but then we have them in all of our tissues. And they are the cells that keep on producing daughter cells that become specialized to keep the, syst uh, the system and the tissue fresh and alive. Um, if these cells resemble stem cells, are they stem cells? Are they adult stem cells after all? Well, they are not, but let me first show you a video courtesy of uh, our colleague Hans Clevers, a pioneer in the field of defining adult stem cells. A video of how tissues look and what the stem cells do in tissues. In this case, the tissue of, inter of interest is the lining of, uh, of the gut. Uh, you may know that the lining is uh, it's, uh, it's a mucosa with a tiny little villi, they are called, protrusions, less than a millimeter. And this is where uh, the food passes through and this expanded surface uh, is where the uh, nutrients from the food are absorbed to pass into the bloodstream. This uh, lining um, gets replenished every day. These cells have to, uh, are exposed to microbes, they are exposed to toxins, so we don't want them around for very long. They are constantly growing uh, in this layer and uh, sloughing off at the tip, going away. This growth is fueled by cells that are up at the bottom uh, of these villi in what is called the crypt. So we see the creep, and now the drawing shows a cross-section. Right here is where the stem cells, the adult stem cells, undifferentiated, reside. These cells, their job is to produce daughters, and daughters now proliferate very actively, faster than mom, that the stem cell. And when they get to the neck, they begin to differ differentiate in the various basic specialized cells of the gut the absorbing cells, the cells that produce mucus, mucus for uh, lubrication, and so forth. As new younger ones are growing at the bottom, the older ones are getting pushed to the top, and when they reach the tip, they um, self-eliminate, and from bottom to top, it all happens in the span of three days. This is how long the cells die. This is how the tissue is kept fresh. So, stem cells. By the way, these stem cells is also where mutations can happen. If mutations, cancer-causing mutations happen, the problem is that these cells will continue to proliferate, maybe faster, but they will forget to differentiate. They get stuck, they begin to accumulate, and that is the beginning of a tumor. Still benign, by the way. This is what forms the polyp that in the colonoscopy they will remove. Okay? So that's the polyp. Polyps are tumors, but they are benign. Why are they benign? Well, because they are not malignant. Why not? Because they have not accumulated additional mutations that graduate them from the benign adenoma, is called, to the malignant carcinoma. 
and the carcinoma is more aggressive, grows faster, and is more invasive and begins to generate those cells that being invasive crawl around, pass into the circulation, and go and infiltrate organs. So where are these L1 CAM cells coming from? Are these cells already presenting this L1 CAM? The answer is no. Karuna Ganesh, another physician scientist working in the lab, look, these are samples from our patients, normal colon. They are clear, they have no brown staining of L1 CAM. Even these adenomas show no L1 CAM, but carcinomas do. That is the image that I used before to illustrate how these cells are infiltrating the blood vessel. But these cells are brown because they are stained for the presence of L1 CAM. Here in the invasion from, in invasion from here and there, there are L1 CAM positive cells. Oh, so they emerge when a tumor has graduated to this carcinoma invasive state. In metastasis, there is an even higher concentration of these L1 CAM positive cells. These are real samples from real uh, people. Uh, when we saw that in other experiments, we began to think, well, maybe these cells emerge, this, this, this will to present and produce this protein that they will need to grow. Maybe it happens when these cells sense that their tissue structure has been disrupted. In this case, by themselves, not by an external wound. Maybe there are cells that are trying to do something about disruption to regenerate the tissue, except in this case, the tissue is the wrong one to regenerate. It's a tumor. Let's look. And when we look in mice, uh, in the normal intestine, like in the human, we saw no staining brown for, uh, uh, for L1 CAM. But if we treated these mice with a treatment that induces small ulcers, small colitis, within a few days of the tissue having been disrupted, cells appear that start making L1 CAM. Now these are normal cells, and these cells are going to be in charge of replenishing uh, the damaged tissue, of healing the wound. Then we did a genetic experiment in mice that were uh, deprived of this L1 CAM gene, specifically just in the intestine. The mice were fine as long as they were not wounded. The moment we wounded them, of course, there could be no L1 CAM producing cells because the gene was gone. And without L1 CAM, there was no regeneration of the wound and the mice died of massive uh, dehydration, diarrhea. So that told us the following, that L1 CAM and the cells that present it, the stem cells that are stem cells with L1 CAM expression, is something that appears uh, in response to wounding, in response to tissue integrity loss, loss of tissue integrity. And it will be up to the cells to replenish this tissue and then go back to normal. When a tumor develops, initially, even though that is a tumor, it's abnormal, the tissue is not disrupted. It's just too much of it. It's a polyp. It will be taken out. We are fine. But if it, this is not detected, not taken out, and accumulates the additional mutations, now it forms a tumor. As the tumor grows and becomes invasive, it self wounds, it self disrupts. That self disruption is detected by these cells, which are now themselves malignant, and they become stem malignant cells with L1 CAM, capable of passing into the circulation, floating away, emerging from the circulation, being able to bind to these capillaries, being able to initiate growth, metastatic growth, unless immunity, astrocytes, and company liquidated them. If this happens, we can treat these cells. We can treat them with therapy. But now we have a concentration of, of, of this element, of this kind of cell. And even though therapy may be very effective, even against metastasis, at removing the bulk, the 90%, maybe what looks like 100%, there, will always, there may always be a few left. And the ones that are left remain with L1 CAM. And this is why metastasis can reactivate more aggressively um, and, and, and more seriously than uh, the capacity of the primary tumor to relapse, to reconstitute itself. These are examples of what metastasis is and how we understand it, how we identify molecules, so molecules that can be turned into targets for therapy. What is the next big thing in this area? 
Well, one thing that you've seen as I went along is that tumors are very heterogeneous. There are cancer cells and non-cancer cells. Among the cancer cells, there are all kinds. Only some of them are the L1 cam positive. This is microscopy, and then with markers, one can determine many different kinds of, of, of cancer cells present in a tumor. We know that there was, there has been a massive revolution in the ability to sequence tumor DNA in order to find all the mutations in our tumors. Sloan Kettering now sequences uh, the genomic DNA of the tumors of every patient that, um, that uh, is treated here. That gives us the mutations that are present in this tumor. Of course, this is bulk sequencing, so this is the mutation in all the cells of the tumor. That sequencing tells us what mutations the tumor has, what drugs may be effective, but doesn't tell us what individual cells in these tumors do. And in order to understand metastasis, we've just seen in tumor uh, growth and spread, we've just seen how important it is to understand what individual cells do, what certain cells do, the stem cells, especially the ones that present this L1 cam. So the revolutionary technology that has just emerged and we recruited here and now is in full swing is one, it's a game-changing technology, which gives us the capacity to do genomic uh, profiling of single cells to learn not what their mutations are. We know them from the bulk sequencing. The entire tumor has those mutations. But individually, what they are up to. How is this technology working? Well, we sequence these cells, thousands of them, uh, from a given tumor sample, one by one. How do we separate the cells one by one? With a microfluidic de uh, uh, device that places individual cells you see them bright here. Uh, uh, together with a bead that has all the reagents to sequence the genome and the transcriptome of these cells in a little droplet. So this is like a test tube. The entire cell population is flown through the channel. And as they advance um, through the channel, I want to run this again for you. Uh, the, the, the cells, as they advance, they are caught in a droplet that contains the bead, a single cell, and that cell will be reacted. And then at the end, because they have a barcode, it's very complicated, but at the end we have tens of thousands of cells ready to be sequenced, ready to be deconvoluted with high-end computation. So microfluidics, engineering, and high-end mathematical talent, computation, have come join cancer biologists and immunologists to understand the progression, beha the behavior and progression of tumors at the level of individual cells to generate data like this. These are samples from real people, from real patients, in this case, lung adenocarcinoma patients. Each one of these dots represents a single cell out of more than 40,000 sequenced from these samples. And we are able to tell what cell type it is. Turns out that only these ones are cancer. All of these are in the tumor, but they are not cancer cells. They are immune cells that are evidently not fighting very well the tumor. They are probably enslaved by it and other cell types. Not only that, we can not only classify these cells and know what they are, but also we can interrogate them one by one and ask what they are up to. Are they growing? Are they not? Are they producing factors that support the tumor? Are they not? And so forth. So and with this I close. Um, this is the quest by uh, my colleagues and I to uh, deconstruct uh, the process of metastasis, achieve, develop basic understanding uh, in order to come up with new ideas to add new treatments that will um, uh, better control uh, and defeat metastasis by adding these treatments to what we already have the targeted precision chemotherapy, the immunotherapy, that are fantastic, but they are not enough. We need to come in with orthogonal, completely different, game-changing drugs that will attack the soul of the cells that have the powers to reproduce, regenerate the tumor at a distance, what we call 
metastasis. We are learning how and why cancer therefore spreads. It's not hocus pocus, it all has its logic. It's based on the normal processes of our bodies, in this case to regenerate wounds, but they are in the, in the wrong hands, in the hands of malignant cells. They will try to regenerate tumor at a distance. We are identifying the molecules that drive these processes, and with that we can develop, imagine and develop new classes uh, of drugs to prevent and treat metastasis. And I thank you very much for being here tonight and your attention. Thank you. So I've heard some oohs and ahs from the audience, so I, I hope that some of your questions have already been answered. Um, I'm Stephanie Posen. I'm the Director of Annual Giving and Special Programs here in the Development Office at MSK. And many of you, uh, I hope that you picked up a program. Uh, we do have a survey inside, so please, um, at the end of the presentation, take a minute to fill out your survey, and if you have ideas, um, please share them on the back. But um, also I bring this to your attention because we already collected many questions, which I'm about to lead us through the question and answer program. If there are questions that you have that aren't answered tonight, please also write them on the back and we'll our, do our best to um, research them and get back to you. So with that, I'll start with a, a beginner question, which are some cancers more prone to metastasis and why? Um, uh, of course, we know that we call them more aggressive, uh, although sometimes these are reserved for cancers that are very aggressive locally. Brain tumors, for example, um, uh, McCain's uh, tumor, they are very aggressive locally. But most tumors, when we call them aggressive, is because they are very good at doing that, too good. Uh, why? Uh, well, uh, evidently, uh, metastasis now we recognize is the result, the end result, the name that we apply to the end result of cells having passed through a series of bottlenecks that are there to eliminate them. So the tumor that is more aggressive is the one that is prepared to have a higher probability, probabilities, a higher probability of reaching the end and reaching it faster. And why some tumors are better equipped than others, this is part of the answers that we are uh, seeking. So is there any way in an early cancer diagnosis to determine if someone's cancer will metastasize? Yes and no. We can determine whether someone has a cancer that statistically is highly aggressive. But that doesn't prove <coughs> that therefore you for sure will get it. Or you uh, metastasis. You have a higher probability. Or you will have it you would develop metastasis with a 100% probability if we did not apply therapy. But with therapy, you have a lower probability. Uh, we cannot tell someone, yes, you will metastasize no matter what we do. Uh, that we, we, we can't because, again, it's just probabilities that uh, something will go wrong because there are some uh, vulnerabilities, something in the system that make it go wrong. But we can never be sure. So if two people get the same diagnosis, and they are both highly aggressive, is there any way to predict who might end up with a, with a growth? If the two people are identical in everything, in what they eat, in what they... Uh, even with that, it would not be possible to predict. How do I know that? Well, our mice, they are genetically identical. We, put, we give them the same number uh, of metastatic cells. And if we lower the number of metastatic cells to just a few thousand, still many, some mice will not develop it, others will develop metastasis, some in one organ, others in another. Again, when the probability that the metastatic cells will succeed is so low, uh, it's one in thousands, even when they are aggressive, then whether it happens or not, and in one organ or not, even in identically treated animals treated the same way, kept the same way, and so forth, uh, you cannot tell that you know, all, of, all of them will come down with metastasis in that organ at the same time. Imagine with us that have very different determinants, very different uh, things that we eat, very different levels of stress, very different immunity, all huge factors in that probability to develop metastasis. And are there certain foods or diets or exercise that could influence in a positive or a negative way? Directly, we don't think so. Indirectly, we think they could. I think it could. But proving it is very difficult. There are studies 
uh, linking uh, exercise uh, to uh, a, a lower probability of developing metastasis. There are ways in which one hypothetically would explain that. These hypotheses are being tracked. Foods, um, in general, uh, I would say the sense is that um, keeping a robust immune system is key. You've seen the power of, in the experimental animals, uh, of the immune system to keep the mouse disease free. That is not just something that has been seen in, uh, in the lab. There is a spectacular experiment, not experiment, spectacular reality uh, in people. If you have a melanoma, malignant melanoma is diagnosed, it's malignant, but it's isolated, uh, it will be removed and you are cured. No malignant melanoma metastasis for you. You're, it's over. You're cured. That's wonderful. Don't go donating your kidney to your brother. Because the recipient will be immunosuppressed and it will derive donor-derived metastasis in the kidney, which is not even a typical site of metastasis in people with cancer. But in the recipient, years later, 10 years later, 15 years later, the kidney has been given, that kidney may explode with metastasis. That's the power of immunity. The donor was cured, would not develop metastasis himself. Metastasis was over, but the pathogens were there. Mm -hmm. And when immunity was removed in the, in the transplant patient, bam. This is not just one case, there is a whole literature and, you know, in transplant clinics uh, they are very careful to screen donors for possible history of having had a, you know, a, a, a little uh, a, a black thing removed from you. No, no, I never, fine, but if you had that, we cannot take your organs. Wow. So That's what, the power of immunity. So what would you say excites you most about this field? You mentioned genomic profiling, the new technologies. What should we be excited to look forward to? I think that the ability to understand, uh, track and analyze, and therefore understand uh, the process, this process especially, at the single cell level is key. Because uh, you know, mutations, finding that, it's, it's great, but tumors are not made by genes, they are made by cells. The cell is the basic life element. It's what will replicate life by making two and four and eight uh, of itself. And we've seen how heterogeneous they are as they, in their own sick ways, differentiate and so forth. Most cells in a tumor are no problem. Uh, unfortunately, the ones that are no problem are also the ones that respond better to therapy and are killed by it. Right. It's the residue, it's what's left that is the problem. And we want to know more, like we are, I shown here, about what's left. And what's left is in the hand of just a few chosen cells. And we want to find out more about them, and you can only do that with single cell uh, technologies added to the rest that, that we have. Right. So before I invite Ken back up here to do some closing remarks, what's the importance of philanthropy in the work that you do? Um, as you may have heard, NIH, federal government, government agencies, they want innovation. They do, they, want, uh, they do want innovation. They want to fund it, but only this much innovation. <laughs> Give them too much innovation. Well, well, the referees will say, well, you know, how do you know that? No, we don't know. This is why we have to try. And that grant never gets funded. Once you make leeway, oh, then they love it. They, they solicit, oh, please send us your application, and we do. So, and this is why we have a great competitive advantage because somehow philanthropy enable us to take the leaps, fail many times, but succeed. When we succeed, then we pave the way for uh, recognition uh, by the funding agencies and funding more of that. And then with that done, we keep feeding the pipeline with new uh, uh, innovation because also with, as, a, as an institution that is privileged with the ability to operate this way, we're also enabling many other institutions that are more modest, that they don't have the resources, they may not have the philanthropic base that, that, that we enjoy. We enable them to begin to study the things that without philanthropy, nobody would be able to do. Great. Thank you. I'm going to invite Ken back up. Yeah. <laughs> Let's give him another round of applause. <laughs> yeah. 
And I, I also want to just thank everyone in the room for taking the time this evening and join us for this talk. I think we learned quite a lot. I want to thank you for your generosity to date. We've, as Dr. Masage said, it's really important for the institution. And I would like to hope that we can continue to count on you for your annual support to help us with our researchers and the scientists who are doing this outstanding work to really fight cancer and to outsmart cancer. So I wish you a good evening. Please join us again at the next time, and uh, please submit your surveys at the, end of the, at, the, at the end of the program so that we can answer any questions that may not have been answered this evening. And thanks again. Bye-bye.